We are live on Zoom. We are recording on both our first double live stream. So uh, hopefully it goes perfectly well. Uh, John Grubbs is our guest today and really looking forward to this. Uh, the title of his workshop today is the three guiding principles for A player candidates. And you know, having worked with a lot of companies over the years around recruiting, developing, and retaining talent in their organization, I, I have seen firsthand the differences between an A player and a B player, <laughs> or an A player and a C player, um, and worst of all, those Ds and Fs or whatever we call them. But it, it's amazing the difference in productivity, in attitude, in um, just all different measurables that an A player has versus someone that's not. And so uh, for all the entrepreneurs that are with us live, welcome. For those that are watching uh, the recording either on Facebook or our private community or the link that we sent out, thank you as well for joining us. Um, we have an awesome speaker here in a very relevant topic. I don't care if you have five employees or 500. Um, this is critical and uh, it makes a massive difference in your organization, finding, uh, onboarding, retaining the right players. So John, the floor is yours. I have the easy part. I had to tee you up and now I get to hang out and listen and take notes. So welcome and thanks for joining the Growth 10 community. We greatly appreciate it. Tom, I am honored to be a part of Growth 10. I'm honored to be a part of this session today. And, and for all of you watching and listening, I, I am so excited to bring this message to you because we are living in an age where talent really does matter. Talent is important. And I believe wholeheartedly that the team with the best talent wins. And I cannot, well, I can't overestimate how often I see organizations just settling for mediocrity. And if you follow me on any of my platforms, you know that I am on a mission, a personal mission to eradicate the infection of average, the infection of ordinary, the infection of common. And I really think that it's, it's almost just like the zombie apocalypse where you have these, uh, these, these mediocre average people pulling at us. And anytime we step out of what people might call average or uncommon, we get judged. We get, uh, well, we get pulled back, just like a zombie would pull someone from normalcy into a crowd of ordinariness. And you know, we, we talk about the infection that's going on. We talk about this, this COVID-19 pandemic that we're all living through and how messages like this are now being delivered in this digital medium because, well, we can't get together. Well, I think the infection of ordinary is far greater and costs organizations far more than what we're seeing from this virus. And when it comes to A players, I'm going to share with you, well, maybe something you didn't quite expect when it comes to looking at how you see talent in your organization. And one thing that I'm going to give you at the end that I think is, well, I think it's relative for today's reality. I mean, we're, we're in a really good place for teams to rethink who they have and who they keep uh, with unemployment the way it is, we're probably never going to be in a better place to upgrade our talent. And I remember like it was just yesterday, I was working in corporate America, gosh, 25 years ago. And one of my things that I would do is I would escape to lunch to get away from the office and I would read at lunch. And this is going to, well, this is going to surface one of my many, many uh, imperfections here, but I was sitting at a Sonic eating a foot long chili cheese coney with mustard and onions. Man, I still love those things. And I'm reading a book called Execution by Larry Bossidy. Now, Larry Bossidy was one of the GE uh, executives that came from the Jack Welch era. And listen to what he said in his book because it felt like Larry literally reached out of the pages of the book and slapped me in the face with this comment. And it was something I really needed to hear as a young manager, as a young executive in my career, because it, it stayed with me until, well, until today. But listen to what Larry Bossidy said in his book, Execution. And I don't mean execution like executed for a crime. I mean executing and how well you execute your plan, how well you execute your purpose as an organization. But Larry said, sometimes you have to let good people go 
in order to get better people in that position for the good of the organization. Now folks, that was something that I had never conceptually thought about or I'd never really embraced, but it stuck with me all these years. Sometimes if performance and execution is what we want in our businesses, we must let good people go in order to get better people in those positions. If success, winning, and execution are the purpose of the organization. Now for me, who is very relational, someone who really bonds with people early, that was a very heavy lift for me emotionally to get to that place. But now as a consultant, as a speaker, as an executive coach, I can't tell you how many times I see organizations infected with ordinary, infected with average, infected with commonness because they are afraid to upgrade their talent. And I don't think we're going to see another time period in our careers that is better ripened for upgrading talent. So that's the, kind of the, the premise of this presentation, three guiding principles for A players. Now, I bet you would have never considered that I'm going to look at A players through the lens of sales. What would Joe Bozzello say to that? that we're gonna look at talent through the lens of sales. Meaning that if you're going to have an organization that is rich with talented individuals, you're gonna to have to sell that to people in order to get them in your organization. And the first idea that I want you to think about is recruiting candidates is the same as prospecting. You have to be recruiting. You have to be in a constant state of looking for these A players. This guiding principle, I think, is something that if you keep nothing else from today's presentation, keep that. That if you really want to, to embrace the A player philosophy, you have to constantly be looking for A player candidates. So think of your A players as prospects. How do we onboard them? How do we identify them? How do we get in contact with them? How do we build trust with them? How do we sell them on the idea of our organization? Principle number two, retaining employees is like customer retention. In other words, once you get an A player on board, the work is not done. The work is now beginning. We have to start this journey of giving them something for which they can contribute, something where they can make a difference. Because here's one truism, the fastest way to lose an A player is to allow them to become bored. And that is the number one reason why I hear people voluntarily leaving organizations is that they were bored. So now that we've got the A player on board, we have to retain them. Recruiting candidates like prospects, retaining employees just like customers. And we all know what happens to a customer when they're neglected, when they're not taken care of. They are courted away and eventually move on to the next organization that is willing to give them what they want, including time, including relationships. And here's the third guiding principle. A players have choices. A players know they're A players. If you're good at something, you know you're good at something. And A players choose to be where they are. And they know that if they left an organization that is rich in mediocrity, they can find another organization. And A players show up. A players deliver. A players have a track record. A players have choices. So I want you to think of this as a complete mind shift approach to talent in the workplace. And just like customers, just like customers, you must keep top performers first. How's that feel? We're going to do the hard stuff first. And the hard stuff is about A players. And A players are different. A players still have issues. And leaders must learn to deal with these issues in order to keep the A players. And I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that you faced when you hire A players and when you manage or lead A players, because they're not always easy. Sometimes it's very, 
difficult because A players, well, they can be temperamental. Listen to the story about a woman named Jane. Does that ring a bell with you? Listen to a story about a man named Jed. Listen to a story about a woman named Jane. After graduating from Harvard Business School with highest honors, Jane rapidly moved up the corporate ladder, racking up promotions and responsibilities. Jane became the company's creative director. She was in everyone's estimation an A player, the organization's most gifted and productive employees. And listen to, listen to this idea, you know, that, that Jane, well, Jane felt underappreciated. And she consistently overperformed. She overperformed her boss and she did great work. But just as you might imagine, Jane needed more. So she worked harder and harder, but more praise never came her way. People just accepted her anus, her ability to deliver at an A level as normal. And the fact that her boss's inability to amply reward her achievement, well, she became frustrated. She was exasperated. She was unhappy. Well, you may not be surprised, but Jane was lured away to a competing company. And this competitive company, well, it turned out to not be as awesome as where she was. It turned out to be worse. So here's the moral of the story. Both lost. Jane lost. She went to an organization that was not as good as her first organization. And the advertising firm she worked for also lost. They both lost. So with this idea, you know, I want to know if you think that A players are more needy. Do you think A players have issues? And here's some patterns among super achievers. This first one is called the super worms. Super worms. And the super worm, despite their veneer of self-satisfaction, smugness, and even bluster, they have a significant number of spectacular formers and they suffer from a lack of confidence. Yeah. People driven by insecurity. Whoa. Well, wait a minute, John. Are you saying that we can have A players who deliver because they're driven by insecurity? Yeah, absolutely. These are the people who went to the right business schools. They, they push themselves to win all the prizes because they're trying to fulfill this something inside them that never seems to be satisfied. So you can help these stars address their inflated sense of superiority and begin to deal with the underlying issues of poor self-worth. So the superworms, the superworms have a poor self-worth. And that leads them to drive themselves, to perform, to achieve. But it's a real issue. It's a real challenge among super achievers. And then you have the people who can't say no. A players have this, in some cases, this inability to set boundaries for themselves. And they operate outside their comfort zones in their efforts to win recognition. And it's not always a productive use of time. And, and they're likely just to back down and try to comply rather than question authority. They always say, yes, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And guess what this leads to? Do you know that many, many A players suffer burnout? And the only way that they can prevent burnout is to move on to greener pastures. To, tr to leave your organization and go work for someone else so that they can start the process all over again. These people who can't say no end up giving you the ultimate no. They end up leaving your organization. And guess what? It's a pattern that's repeated because the A player leaves with another superb credential on her resume, on his CV. It becomes a pattern. 
And it's something you can identify when you see someone who hits home run after home run with organization after organization, and they're there in two or three year periods of time. And you say, wow, this is an A player. But look, maybe, maybe, they, maybe they suffer from burnout real easily because they can't say no. Well, there's another pattern for A players. And these are A players who disrespect subordinates. They, you might call them a dissing Daniel. And dissing Daniel is comfortable keeping company with his boss, with the boss, with people above him in the organization. And guess what? That becomes an asset to him in his career because he's always hanging out with the people who have the authority to help him accomplish more, get the promotion, get the best, you know, get the best gig, whatever it is, he's around people who are influential and able to help him. And these people develop an ease with authority figures early in life. And it could possibly be, yes, I'm going to go there by appeasing a demanding parent. Many A players were teacher's pets who grew into the company man or the company woman. And the goodwill they earn with their bosses can often make them hostile to those at their own level or below, whom they usually regard as being less capable. Dissing Daniel works with people who are less capable than him, and he ends up not respecting those people because they can't do what Daniel can do and find a greater aversion with peers than they do with people who are higher in the organization than they are. And you can call this two faced where the people above an, an individual in an organization see one person and the people that are at their level or below see a completely different human being. Wow. So I took you through the hard stuff first. Now let's talk about the good news. There is good news with A players. It's the reason we want them. It's the reason we seek them. And when you're coping with A players, it's really not as difficult as it seems. Yes, A players want a lot. Yes, A players demand a lot. But when they are given the right amount of opportunity, it's not as hard as it seems. So I don't want you to think that John Grubbs is saying A players are hard to deal with. They can be challenging, but it's not as difficult as it seems because they get things done. They get the ball moving. They close deals. They make things happen within your organization. So when you struggle with an A player, here's what I want you to do first. Think about your own emotions. Why are you feeling the way you are feeling about that A player? And when it comes to recruiting A players, you may feel this in a job interview. You may feel this in an interaction where you may feel threatened, especially if you're the alpha person in the room. The A player is going to match your level of intensity, your level of emotion, your level of uh, whatever it is you contribute to the organization because they've felt that way themselves. They tend to be the alpha in the room. It's not coincidental that A players can be called alpha players. And it can be hard to manage people with talent. They're talented. You see that in the sports world all the time. Or measure how well someone performs relative to a peer group. They stand out. They're easy to, well, separate from the herd. And how hard is it to manage people with high intellect? You know, there are people that can think on multiple planes about multiple topics at the very same time and come to conclusions much faster than their peer groups. And with those players, it's when I coach, when I coach an A player, one of the things I have to do is I said, look, everybody is not where you are intellectually with that topic or that idea. And that in order to get buy-in, you may need to back up in order to help them see what you're able to see at an early stage. And it's really important that we understand that A players can have a high degree of imagination. When I'm interviewing A players, one of the things that I do is I try to tap into that imagination or, or that ability to see things that other people can't see. 
and to ask them visioning questions. You know, what's your vision of the ideal company? You know, how would you see a company that was wanting to go in this direction? Those visioning questions when interviewing can give you a high degree of confidence that someone has imagination. And the biggest challenge I face, coach, especially coaching CEOs, is that it's important that when you are not only interviewing or searching for A players, is that you not allow your own envy to creep into the equation, where you're envious of someone who may be better than you at a certain function. And to get really, I guess, mature as a CEO, you want to hire people who are better than you in all of the major functions from which you oversee. In other words, you want to have someone that's financially stronger than you as a CFO. You want to find someone who can sell better than you as your VP of sales, or you want to have someone who's better administrative as your chief administrative officer. You want people with high degrees of talent, but sometimes our own ego gets in the way. Especially if we came from one of those functions from which now we are leading in our organization. And here's the thing about A players. A players can easily push your buttons. They know how to get you off of a difficult situation. They know how to get you moving in a direction that they want you to go. So how do we keep A players? That's the question. You know, when I help organizations put together a talent strategy, one of the first things we do is identify target companies so that we can go get their A players. And the cool thing about A players is they run in herds. They have a pack mentality. So how do you, how do you recruit and how do you keep A players once they're on board? So the first thing that you have to do is praise them personally. Don't praise their department. Don't praise their organization. Praise them personally. What are they doing specifically that is contributing to the success in the organization? And praise them often. You know, I, I teach a, a philosophy that you need to sit with your A players and talk about their performance at least monthly. And if you can't do it monthly, no more than quarterly. But I think monthly is the right cadence for keeping A players. And something else you have to do with your A players is you have to set clear boundaries. You know, many A players are from the same school of thought as I am. I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. If you hire me to do something, I am going to do it at 120 miles an hour. And the worst thing that I want to learn is that you are going to tell me that I'm moving in the wrong direction. That would be a problem for me. And, you know, if, if you're in a, a situation with, a, with an A player and you don't set boundaries, they're going to continue to push those boundaries and push those boundaries until you give them something to stop them. Good indicator of someone who is an A player, especially if you're recruiting, is to ask them the question about boundaries. You know, what, what boundaries are you willing to push? How are you willing to challenge the status quo within our organization? Another thing that you have to do to keep A players is really be cognitive of superstar burnout. They burn hot. And if a candle burns hot, it burns fast. And A players are not typically very good at monitoring their own emotional status because they're so ingrained in their work. They're so involved in their activity that they work really, really hard. And I coach some CEOs who are what I call A players, and they're always adding to their list. And one of the ways that you can help an A player deal with burnout is to coach them to have a stop doing list. What are you going to stop doing? And how do you put in place a mechanism so that you're not doing too much all the time? I call that weaning the A player off the organization. And when you're recruiting, you can ask questions about their past to see if you sense that they may have approached burnout in other jobs. Another important thing for A players is to make sure they play nice. It is very common for A players to lack emotional intelligence. In other words, they don't see how their wake affects others in the organization. 
Uh, funny thing, I, I bought a boat during a pandemic and I've been kicking back and forth the idea of buying a boat for years. I never thought I would use the boat enough. And one of the things that I've made a commitment to is that I was going to come out of this pandemic a little bit different than I went in. So I came out as a boat owner and we were on a, uh, a lake close to where I live in East Texas. And there was a, uh, a boat that came by one of the, that does wake surfing. Well, I bought a pretty good sized boat and this wake surfing boat created such a huge wave that it, it's the first time that a wave had crossed over into my boat and I laughed and everybody on the boat got wet. Uh, I didn't get angry. I just thought it was funny, but it made me think about the A players and the wakes that they live. They leave a wake and when they leave a wake, they're going to affect other people. So it's really important with A players to monitor the wake. How are they impacting their peers? They're getting more FaceTime with the CEO, with the boss. They're, they're, they're moving into other people's areas of, of activity. How do you monitor their relationship with others. So you have to make them play nice. Here's something else that's important. A players don't have to be the top as an organization to stay, but they have to be paid above average. An A player knows his or her value. And if they're not paid above average, they won't stay. They need to be paid above the median wage for that job in an organization. And here's why. Think about this number. Research shows that 80% of a business's profits are generated by 20% of its workers. That's right. That's your A players. And if they know they're generating 80% of the profits and some of that is not coming to them, then guess what? They're not likely to stay. It's also a great question for you to ask in an interview. Tell me about your contribution to profit in your last three jobs. How did you impact profit? How did you impact the business? And to look for real life examples that you can drill into to assess whether or not someone is an A player. Because here's, here's an axiom. An axiom is a self-evident truth. A players know they're A players and they know they're making a difference. And to say that they don't realize the impact they have on the organization is a little bit disingenuous. So A players can have a huge impact on your bottom line and they are going to know it. So are they worth it? Some might say anecdotally that, well, if, if all you're saying is true, John, are, are they even worth having on the team? Well, think of it in this context. I'm a sports guy. I loved baseball. I played baseball. I coached baseball. Imagine the difference one ace pitcher makes in a team. Imagine the difference an ace quarterback makes for a team. Imagine the difference that an ace point guard makes for a team. If winning and organizationally performing is what you seek, then yes, the more A players you have, the more often winning will occur, the more often profitability will occur. So how do we recruit A players? Hmm. You have to develop a talent seeking culture, meaning you have to have a culture that is rich with looking for and always embracing more talent. It means we have to suppress the ego of average, that, that average is okay, that being common or acceptable is okay. You do this by building a healthy pipeline. You're always looking for A players. And everybody knows that you're always looking for A players. Everybody knows that they have to perform. It's what Jack Welch called a performance-based culture. And paint an accurate picture of the job's demands. And I love using challenging job descriptions. Now, there is a fabled ad that was run in a newspaper in the early part of the 1900s. And it was Ernest Shackleton's ad that was for people to go on an well, an exploration to Antarctica. Now listen to this ad. This was actually, well, allegedly run in a paper. There's, there's some questions about this, but it's a great story. This is the actual ad. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness. 
constant danger. Safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. Reply to 4 Burlington Street, Ernest Shackleton. Now let me read that ad again. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Do you know many, many, many people responded to that ad? This idea of something big, something remarkable. So when I'm helping organizations write a job description for an A player, I think of Ernest Shackleton's ad. I think of what he said in his ad that challenges people to say, hey, this company's a little bit different. This is not a job description that I've ever read before. Another thing that's essential is to have a great website. Just like in sales, just like in sales, 70 to 80% of the buying journey takes place online. And if an A player knows that you're in interest of them, or if they have an interest in your organization, the first thing they're going to do is go to your website. And if you have a brochure, some people have, a, have wonderful websites that are nothing more than just a brochure. It's a digital brochure. If that's what you have, it portends very serious mediocrity in your organization. A great website is interactive. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of uh, opportunity for people to learn and to get information and to be challenged. They're just a little bit different. A players are going to check you out online before they agree to meet with you. And pr always present this image of selectivity that you're not needy. I don't think any A player is attracted to a needy organization. I was on a sales call with a large company uh, earlier today and, you know, I told them, Hey, you know, we may not be a good fit. You know, the thing we, we need to do is discover whether or not we align uh, when it comes to the work that we're considering, because if we don't align, I don't want to do the work. I don't want to waste your time or my time moving any further if we're not in alignment. And when you recruit A players, they need to see growth opportunities within your business. If they don't see a place for them to go, guess what? They're not joining your team. They don't want to join your organization and be capped out. And the last thing that I'll tell you A players look for are other A players. One of the best things you can do if you're looking for an A player, if you're interviewing an A player, is to let them have lunch with one of your other A players. Let those two individuals sit down and break bread together. You will see a very quick uh, recognition that occurs because A players recognize other A players. They see something different in each other because they see it in themselves. So back to sales. Hiring A players is like closing deals. The hiring journey equals the buying journey. Recruiting talent in your organization is just like a CRM pipeline. Never sound needy. A players will not come to an organization that sounds needy. They want to be challenged. And always bolo for talent. What is bolo? Always be on the lookout for talent. And consider A players as an investment. Always make room if you can. A players want company with other A players and differentiate your team from average. Just like you have differentiation in your marketing in, for, in your marketing materials, you need to have differentiation on your website. We don't hire ordinary people. We don't hire just anyone because A players go where the A players are. And here's a sales analogy that I think you will uh, identify with. I'm always helping organizations in my sales training hunt for whales. Now, how do you think whale hunters found whales? Do you think they got in their small boats? This is, again, many, many generations ago. Do you think they got in their small boats and just traveled around the ocean looking for a whale? How efficient do you think that is? What they actually did was they, they correlated a special type of bird 
that this bird was a bird that followed whale pods or a whale. And someone was always on the lookout for those birds. And when they saw those birds, they knew that there was a whale out there. And then they would get in their boats and go whale hunting. So you need to look for whatever opportunities open up your business to find A players. Is it, is it going to the right events? Is it looking in the right places? Is it being part of the right group like Growth 10, for example? Growth 10 could be a place where you find A players. I mean, we're talking about growth. You have to go where the whales are and you have to look for things that help you identify where the A players are. So here's the pro tips, and then I'll open this up for questions. Quantify talent in your organization. If you want to attract A players, quantify talent. I have a seven step process for actually measuring talent to get a talent score in your business. Look for target rich environments for A players. There are target rich environments everywhere. A players congregate. A players like the company of other A players. And probably the most important thing is to have a compelling story. Just like the stories I've shared with you today, have a compelling story. Ernest Shackleton had a heck of a story. People were going to go with him for low wages on a trip they may never, never return from. And send your hunters into the woods to find A players. Be on a constant, perpetual search for people who will increase the capability of your organization. Collect stories for your website. I love A player stories on the website. And keep this simple. All the things I'm describing are not difficult. Keep it simple. And just like I tell salespeople, be aggressive and relentless. Average people are not aggressive. Average people are not relentless. Be aggressive and be relentless. And just remember this pro tip. A players will not tolerate mediocrity long. If you are in an organization that is mediocre, you are constantly at risk of losing your A players. So here's some final thoughts. <clears throat> I want you to share with me what stuck with you. And before we get off, I want to know, what do you want to go deeper with? You can find free stuff with me at johngrubs.com. And I hope all of you will follow and subscribe to my podcast, Crazy Enough to Win, because it is about people crazy enough to go big in the game of life. So with that said, I will turn it over to Tom to facilitate questions in the organization. Uh, what's going on? All right. So your talent score assessment, that's available at johngrubs.com? Yeah, it's available. Well, I introduced an article on how to do it. Yeah, but I don't tell everything. Got it. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just curious where people could find out more information about That's really cool. Um, all right. A couple questions. The first one was do organizations spend enough time with A players? And so I, I think what, what we're asking is, all right, I've got, let's just say I've got a team of six and we've got a couple A's, a couple B's, a couple C's. Do you think that managers, leaders, and organizations are spending the right time with A players or do they waste their time in other areas with other people? So great question. I think that uh, the, the person that should have the least amount of time is a C player. And what I, what I tell organizations is you spend most of your time with two population segments, your A players and your B players who have the potential to be A players. Those are the places where you spend most of your time. If you have a B player that doesn't have the potential, if they're, if they're a constant B minus, they may be a great workhorse, they may be a great plow horse, uh, and they have a very important role in the organization, but they're not as needy of your time and your feedback as the people in the other two populations. You mentioned uh, making sure that A players were not bored. So how do you keep A players from being bored at work? It's a beautiful question. So remember, I, I recommend that you sit with your A players at least once a month to just kind of check their pulse, to feel what's going on with them in the organization. And that is where you look for and try to discern whether or not they're, they're being challenged enough. And, you know, if, if if, if you ask questions like, how do you feel about your role in the organization? How do you feel about the impact you're having in the organization? I think you'll, you'll surface whether or not that's an issue or not. The next one, you, you mentioned about A players and, and, and needing to be compensated above average. So, you know, in my work with organizations, 
I hear a lot of variations of, oh no, you know, the, the younger talent, they don't care about money. Oh, people just want a cool place to work and they just care about their manager. Um, I, I don't believe that to be true, but you know, what, what are the views of A players in terms of money and compensation and how do they relate that to, you know, how they're perceived? Because I think that's an important question and not that money cures all, but I guess I want to understand, you know, generally speaking, what are, how do A players feel about their compensation and money? Yeah. <clears throat> well, A players are not doing it just for the sake of doing it. They have to be competitively rewarded for their effort. And unless they're in an organization where that is the, the that's the, that's the precept, you know, teachers, uh, coaches, ministers, some of those jobs, you, you go into it for reasons other than compensation. But in most cases, an A player who knows her contribution to the organization wants to be rewarded fairly for that contribution. You know, if you imagine you have two sales professionals, one is bringing in 80% of your revenue and the other is bringing in 20% of your revenue. How long will she be satisfied with that inequity? It's, 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 it's common sense, but it's not common. You know, we want to be rewarded for our effort. And I think if you don't, if you don't have at least above average for your top performers, you're at a high risk of losing them anyway. So when an A player looks at a C player in an organization or looks around and sees multiple C players, what goes through their mind? Just think about it like sports. You know, when, when you played sports, you know, you know, you know who the contributors are and you know who aren't contributing. And what I'm tell people is, you know, you can have some C players on your team, but an A player will not stay in a world of C players very long. They, they, they won't feel challenged. They won't feel, they won't feel like they're, well, like they're being utilized to their max or they feel like they're having to do it all. They're having to carry the entire load themselves. And then our last question comes from Tom Healy here in Scottsdale. I'm curious about this one. So, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I'm thinking about organizations that have leadership teams. So you, you were talking about the idea of, look, your, your CFO, your chief sales officer, these should be really talented people. They should be A players. Makes perfect sense to me. But give us an example or, or maybe some trends you see. I mean, are there times where people, and, and maybe it's subconscious, maybe it's just outright they're doing this on purpose, but are there times where people are threatened or scared to put people on their leadership team that are too smart or may challenge them a little bit? I'm, I'm just curious about that. I think that is extremely common, but it's not extremely talked about. You know, every one of us have an ego. We have an ego that is powerful in our lives. And it just, let's, use the word, let's use the lens of sales. If I came to the CEO role from sales and I was the A player all along, and all of a sudden I bring in this talent, this, this salesperson who is, is better than me or potentially better than me, my ego is going to be impacted. It's our ability to deal with our ego that's the real issue. And what I tell people is if, if you can ever get in your mind to make this mental shift from being a performer to being someone who recruits and attracts and retains performers, it's a mental hurdle that will give you much more happiness in the role of CEO. Yeah, yeah, I was good in my time, but man, this person's really good. And, and I, I use the, you know, the sports analogy with that too. I, my dad was a pretty good football player. I played and got some recognition. Uh, but now I'm very proud of my son who's playing well. And it doesn't take away from what I did. I'm just proud of him. So, so if, when, you, when you can have that conversation in that light, that I can be proud of you, Tom, for being my top sales guy because this is your time. This is your time to shine. And I know the organization wins as a result. Do you think that in the organizations that you come across, when you first meet them or first interact with them, do you think overall organizations do a good job with properly uh, compensating? And I'm not just talking about a base salary, but bonuses, commissions, profit sharing, 
stock options. Do you think companies do a good job top to bottom of incentivizing people to want to be A players and then retaining them? Or do you look at that and go, you know, most companies have a pretty significant opportunity to do better in this area? Uh, I'll share a story with you. I was working with a CEO, I think last month, and um, a one of the top salespeople uh, used to make about $450,000 a year in that organization. And the owner of the company decided that was too much. So he cut him back to $250,000. I'm like, okay, what's that going to lead to? And what's remarkable, Tom, is, is the guy is still there, but he's totally, totally dissatisfied with his job. And even though you kept him, he's probably a shell of what he was before in that environment. And from a compensation standpoint, you know what, especially in business development, I think to the victor goes the spoils. If you can sell for me and make me X, I'll give you Y and I'll give it to you all day long. I don't care if it's five figures or six figures or even seven figures. If you, if you earn it, you earned it. And I think when we can live with that reality, instead of thinking they're making too much money, we really think about the contribution that they make. What, what's the value add to the business? And the value add to the business needs to be a match with the compensation that they have for the organization. And I think if you follow that simple axiom, you know, if someone's contributing a small amount, then they get a small amount. If someone's contributing a lot, they should get a lot. That's, that's my opinion. What are your thoughts? Well, I, 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 I see massive, I, I, the word I go back to a lot is alignment. And I, I just don't feel that organizations do a good job of aligning their compensation packages with performance. And so, well, hey, there's a cap on what I can make. Well, why is there a, is there a cap on what you can sell? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, is there profit share? I mean, you know, as you're, you're sharing that story, I'm just thinking of the mental psyche of this individual. So you've cut my pay in 450 to 250, it could be 45 to 25, it doesn't matter. The point is, you almost cut me in half. And so I don't see that person getting out of bed any earlier. I don't see them getting into the office any earlier. What I see is someone that goes, I'm not answering emails on weekends. Why, why would I do that? So they've now disengaged from the work and, and they're not working as hard. So I like finding opportunities and wins and, and it doesn't have to be major things, but just a little bit of profit mm. share makes me think, well, maybe I'll work a little harder. Maybe I'll have a little better of an attitude. Maybe I'll stay here longer. And so I just find that there are so many easy wins for organizations of all sizes to better motivate their people yeah. to contribute and they just miss out on it. The profit share doesn't mean that, hey, John, uh, instead of you, uh, you know, being able to pay your mortgage, you're going to give all the profits of the business to your employees. That's not what it's saying, but it's carving out a nice little percentage to where you do well, they do well. Everyone wins. And I, I again, you, you, you know, if you can tell your team we share in profits or we have a stock plan if you've been here for X number of years um, or if there's a, a sale of the company because that's what we're going towards, you're going to be taken care of. That really motivates people and they feel connected and they're going to work harder and they're less likely to leave. So I just, I like when organizations do that ultimately. And I think this ties in very well with your talk and it's a great way to wrap things up. I just feel that if you do those things, you're going to find and keep a players because mm -hmm. they care about that. Hey, I'm, I'll, I'll leave it all out on the field for this guy, but you know, I want to make sure that I'm taken care of. Yeah, and, and here's the thing, Tom, and especially all of you listening right now, success is infinite. There is no limit to success. Success is, you can have as much success as you want. There's no theoretical limit. And when you start to limit people's, well, not just their compensation, but their, their ability to move the needle for an organization, you limit what I call discretionary effort. And this is what you pay me for. But man, I'll, I've got all this that you can have if you'll just treat me the right way. I'll give you that extra and the, the getting up in the morning early, the taking calls, all those things are discretionary effort. And unfortunately, when you start to take away from your A players, you lose that effort. You lose that extra gear, that extra bit of gas in the tank that they would give you because, well, you earned it from them. So that's a, it's a great way to look at that, Tom. And I, I appreciate you asking some insightful questions.
Well, we, we appreciate you being here. Uh, for those that were here live, thank you. It's great to have you. For those watching on Facebook or watching the recording, we appreciate it as well. JohnGrubs.com. I'm sure that's a great way to connect with you and follow you. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. But we appreciate you making the time for our community. And uh, thanks for uh, contributing to Growth 10. We appreciate it, John. My pleasure.